the end. So Daniel, I'll let you introduce yourself. You're probably better at it than I am. So I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. Uh, hey everyone. So um, I'm Daniel Solenberger. I'm a senior wildlife biologist with Wildlife Conservation Section. And uh, I'm, I'm primarily function as our state's herpetologist. So I work with uh, amphibians and reptiles, uh, frogs, lizards, snakes, turtles. Um, I don't do alligators though. Those are, those are a game species in Georgia. <clears throat> um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the exotic amphibians and reptiles that we have in Georgia. We have uh, several that are certainly established here. And then, you know, a few others that turn up from time to time. So um, without further ado, we'll get going. Um, <clears throat> I say we'll get going. There we go. Um, so uh, why we care about invasive species in Georgia um, is uh, there's multiple reasons, but just to give you an idea of where Georgia stands and what we stand to lose, uh, we're, we're a very diverse state. We have um, some of the most diverse fish and wildlife and plants in the whole nation. Uh, we're second in amphibian species, depending on how you break some things down, um, what you count as a species or not. Um, <clears throat> third in freshwater fish, we have lots and lots of uh, freshwater fish species in Georgia. Most of those are not the ones you eat, um, but if you if you look into it, you'll find that we have um, an incredible amount of fish diversity, pretty good reptile diversity, seventh in the nation, and then the same for vascular plants. So um, we, we have a lot to lose here in Georgia. Uh, and when we talk about invasive species, there's some terminology that gets used. And I, I've heard a lot of people use the same words in different ways to mean different things. And so to kind of clear up what I'm talking about, um, I want to go over a little bit of terminology. So first of all, you'll you, we have native species. Those are species that evolved here. <clears throat> They're naturally found here. They have probably been here for, in, in most cases, uh, many thousands, if not millions of years, more or less unchanged. Um, and then we have a few that uh, may not have been here as long, but they got here uh, through natural range expansion. And so uh, we've seen that with a, a couple birds, for instance, um, the cattle egrets or, or what people sometimes call cowbirds, even a, a true cowbird is actually a, a different kind of bird, but, but the big white um, egret-like birds you see in cow pastures, uh, following the herds of cattle around, catching grasshoppers, or following your mower around, catching grasshoppers. Those are actually from Africa, um, but we don't consider them exotic or invasive because they got here naturally. They actually crossed over to South America um, in the middle of the 20th century and then migrated north. And so those are, are those are treated as a native species. Um, exotic species are species that are not naturally found here. So an animal that, that's not native to this area or the area we're talking about. So an elephant or a giraffe or a zebra are exotic species. They're not naturally found in Georgia without, you know, they wouldn't be here without human assistance. And then we have some exotic species that become naturalized meaning not only were they not from here and brought here usually by humans, whether that be intentionally or accidental, um, but not only were they brought here, but they were able to establish a self-sustaining population. Um, fire ants are naturalized. Uh, they came over in shipping materials into Mobile in the middle of the 20th century um, and have spread throughout, throughout the Southern US. Um, Bermuda grass from your lawn and, and golf courses, that's become naturalized. Uh, even some uh, landscaping plants like cannas and daffodils, if you've ever walked through the woods and you, you're out, you know, it looks like a, a native uh, community of plants. And then all of a sudden, often up on top of a hill or something, there's like a patch of daffodils in the woods. 
um, that was probably an old home site. Those have, the, those have kind of naturalized in that area. And so naturalized or exotic species that have established populations here, it does not necessarily mean they're invasive, although many times they do become invasive. There are certainly plenty of examples of those, including a few of the ones I just listed. Uh, invasive species are exotic naturalized species that cause some kind of ecological or uh, agricultural or economic harm. They, they, they disrupt native ecosystems or they interfere with uh, some other things that we like to do, like, like uh, you know, agricultural pests and, and, or parasites and diseases and things like that. Those are invasive species. So many exotic species are invasive, but not necessarily all of them. There's, and there's kind of a spectrum. Uh, I'll point out a few that, you know, there's certainly some that are worse than others and, and uh, we'll probably spend more time on those. So we have examples here, the uh, green anole in the upper left, that's a native lizard, a very common lizard. Most people have probably seen those in their yard or in their gardens. Um, and then the, uh, the gecko up here, the Mediterranean gecko, that's a, an exotic species that is naturalized in Georgia, but it's probably not invasive. And then um, the, the tegu down here, the black and white tegu is something that, that certainly is invasive where it's found in Florida and likely has the potential to be here in Georgia. So this is a picture of a Burmese python, and that, that's one that was kind of a, a big concern, uh, still is, uh, certainly in Florida and we, potentially in Georgia. Um, but for the most part, this is a Florida thing. This is a Florida problem, and we hope that it stays that way. Uh, but they do get very large, and they are invasive. They'll eat anything. This one has something in its belly. I'm I, uh, not sure what. Uh, but fortunately, uh, our in exotic snakes are actually really small. Um, this is, to my knowledge, the only exotic snake species to have probably naturalized in Georgia. The Brahmini blind snake or flower pot snake, they are a very tiny snake. The, you can see the picture on the right, that's in someone's hand. And then on the left, they're in a uh, kind of a Tupperware container with a penny. Um, so about the size of a, actually a very small worm, um, three inches long or so, two to three inches long. And um, they're nearly blind and uh, they live underground and uh, you, you wouldn't really see them unless you were kind of digging in your garden or, or potting plants or something like that. But they are native to Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, best we can tell. It is kind of hard at this point to know exactly what the native range is because they're really good at um, moving around the world in uh, soil. Uh, they, you know, transporting plants or other other material that has soil or um, leaf litter in it, um, they can get transported very easily. And so they have managed to make it around the world in the tropics and subtropical zones. If you go to Florida, these are very common. Uh, if you're around, you know, Tampa or, um, you know, Clearwater, uh, Titusville, Orlando, they're, they're pretty common snake. Um, one of the reasons they're able to get around so well is that you see that word parthenogenic and that's a, a really big word that basically means it is an all-female species that can lay eggs, fertile eggs, without mating. There, there are no males as far as we know and the females are capable of producing uh, fertile eggs completely on their own and that's a really handy adaptation to have um, if you make your living by jumping around uh, Pacific Islands, you know, and, and that's part of your, your survival strategy is to colonize new places. Um, and uh, so they, they, they are, it only takes one in theory. And so uh, that probably has contributed to their success. And they, uh, they mostly ants and termites. They, they're, they're small. Um, as far as we know, they aren't really a problem at all. I don't think they're any benefit. I don't, I don't think they actually eat enough ants and termites to like protect your house or your picnic, but um, they probably don't cause very many problems. But we have these, um, these have turned up 
several parts of Georgia, uh, certainly along the coast, it's, it's pretty likely there are reproducing populations on the coast of Georgia in the coastal region. They've also turned up around Albany, Georgia and Southwest Georgia. And then they've also turned up in some nursery stock up around uh, Athens. And uh, so uh, moving around potted plants, that's, that's one of the main ways these things, these things get around. Uh, somebody says that python had eaten a deer. It was caught by one of our contractors. Okay. Yeah, I could tell it was something big. Oh, and somebody else says, how do you tell the difference? Well, these, these are, um, uh, being a snake, they have scales. It, it doesn't show up in the picture very well, but they do have uh, small, smooth scales if you look closely, and you'll actually see their tongue flick out. They have a small forked tongue. You'll see that flicking, flicking out back and forth. And uh, their body's not broken up into segments like a like an earthworm. It's just it's smooth, um, like a, a shiny black uh, tube. <laughs> so um, you, you won't notice any eyes or anything like that. They have very tiny eyes covered with skin, but but you will see the tongue and you can see the scales. Uh, another one uh, similar situation is the uh, are the house geckos, and uh, we've got. These two species that can occur in Georgia in different places, certainly the most common one and most widespread is the Mediterranean gecko. That's the photo here in the uh, kind of the bottom center of the, the slide. And then another one, the wood slave or cosmopolitan uh, house gecko or tropical house gecko. Um, it's a close relative. And that's the, the picture over on the right. You can see they look very similar. Um, there's some subtle differences in the color and the, the skin texture and things like that. But for the most part, house geckos are, uh, you really pale lizards. They have uh, you know, usually uh, very light tan beige, um, it's colored skin, and they have some sm small dark blotches throughout. Uh, but those can fade with their, you know, they, they can change color a little bit, not like a chameleon can change color, um, but they can, their, their pattern can fade, you know, come and go. And so sometimes they're almost white. They, they look uh, ghost-like, you know, and they're kind of translucent. They have very thin skin. And um, so thin, in fact, that if you were to catch one and hold it up to a light, you could see all of its organs through its belly. They, they have very thin, pale skin. And um, they usually have at least a few warts on their skin, these kind of bumpy textured um, scales, tubercle-like scales on their skin, which most of our lizards do not have. Uh, most of our lizards either have smooth scales or um, kind of keeled scales. They look, they look rough all over like sandpaper. These have like warts, kind of like a toad. Um, and then where you would see them most often is near houses and uh, in, in towns, you know, buildings, places that have uh, some kind of climate control. They are native to, uh, well, the, the wood slave is native to more so to Asia, and then the Mediterranean gecko gets its name from the Mediterranean region. Um, those are not necessarily all tropical places, but they do, they do uh, succumb to very cold weather. You know, they can't, they can't live or they don't seem to be able to survive far away from human habitation in Georgia. Uh, it's some warmer parts of the world they can survive out in the woods, but here in Georgia they, they tend to be what we call synanthropic, which means found near human habitation. Um, and so uh, in, in certain cities, you know, I, I lived in Tifton for quite a while and there are quite a lot of geckos there. Uh, you'll see them around porch lights at night and uh, mainly in the summertime out eating bugs and stuff. And, and that's, that's pretty much um, the limit of their effect. Um, and they're uh, unique in that they're one of the few lizards that can vocalize. You can actually detect them by hearing them at night. If, even if you don't have a porch light, you'll sometimes hear these chirping noises on your porch that don't sound like any crickets you're familiar with. It's possible those are geckos. And they, they've been found in cities across most of Georgia. Um, up as far as Rome, actually, uh, had a, someone send in some pictures from Rome, Georgia, uh, up in Northwest Georgia pretty recently. Um, someone asked if, uh, do house geckos regenerate limbs and tails? They certainly regenerate tails. Uh, most lizards can regenerate their tail. I don't believe they can regenerate their limbs. 
I think that's a little bit too complex for, for a lizard, but there, there are some salamanders that can do that. Uh, another one that you may see a lot, um, especially in the southern half of the state and then and along the coast and then uh, potentially near cities as you move farther north is the brown anole. So we have a native green anole that I showed you a picture of earlier. And in fact, there's another picture there in the lower right. Those are green anoles. Those are our native uh, lizards that uh, they're sometimes called chameleons because they can change color from green to brown. And, um, but, but as you can see, green anoles, they're usually just solid color. They don't have a lot of markings. The brown anole, which is the top picture with the big throat fan dewlap sticking out, uh, they're almost always some shade of brown, but to go along with that, you can see there's a, a lot of uh, striping and bars. They have these yellow specks and bars on their side, and then often some stripes on the back. Uh, their snout is shorter. Uh, you know, the, their nose from their, from their eyes to the tip of their snout is shorter, whereas green and olds have a, a very long slender snout. And then um, the dewlap color is bright orange with a yellow outline. The male anoles have that, it's, uh, it's a display uh, organ, I guess you'd say, where they, they use that to advertise to other males, uh, their territory, and also to attract females. Uh, whereas green anoles, it's just kind of a light, kind of solid pink color. And uh, large males often have dorsal crests. You can't quite make it out here, but um, brown anoles will often have a, a big flap of skin basically down their back and on their nape uh, when, they, when they get big. Green anoles, it uh, can have that too sometimes, but it's, it's not quite as large. And uh, so brown anoles are from uh, Cuba primarily. Um, they got to Florida and have spread northward uh, through uh, mainly people moving them around, uh, hitching rides on vehicles and in luggage and boxes and um, Again, plants, nursery stock, things like that. They, uh, again, are most kind of like geckos. You mostly find them near human habitation, but they, ha they can expand outside of that sometimes if there's, you know, some, some woods near, you know, nearby, kind of the adjacent areas to a, um, a, a town or a city, they, they can certainly inhabit those. And uh, unlike the anoles, uh, one thing I think I forgot to mention, it might have been on the slide, but a knoll, um, I said unlike a knolls, unlike geckos, uh, is a, a knolls are diurnal. Uh, geckos are nocturnal, meaning they come out at night. And even if they were found very far from a house, they wouldn't have as big of an effect on our native lizards just because they don't overlap as much uh, in terms of their diet and the, the, uh, their activities. Brown anoles do pretty much the exact same thing our green anoles do. They're out in the daytime. They're using the same kinds of habitats, at least in suburban areas. And um, they've been known to uh, outcompete uh, green anoles. And also they, they'll eat the, uh, the baby native green anole uh, offspring. They'll, they'll eat the babies. And so there's at least some anecdotal evidence that uh, brown anoles could, can cause declines in some native lizards where they occur. So these would be maybe approaching invasive status. Uh, this is our first amphibian we've talked about. Uh, we don't have very many exotic amphibians uh, around the world really in general, but, but if, if you're going to have an exotic amphibian, frogs are pretty good at getting around for whatever reason. Uh, salamanders haven't proven very good at making their way around the world. Um, but frogs, we do have a few frogs. And uh, this is the greenhouse frog or the Cuban flat-headed frog. They changed the name for some reason uh, fairly recently. Uh, but I guess they felt like greenhouse frog wasn't descriptive enough. Uh, but Cuban flat-headed frogs, so as the name implies, they're from Cuba. They're also from some other Caribbean islands. And um, again, transported into Florida, and then from that point have been hitching rides uh, with our help north. Um, and, and you can find these now along the coast of Georgia and across a, a scattered areas in South Georgia pretty commonly. I know... Um, 
where again here in, in, in Tifton, uh, over in South Central Georgia, where I used to live, these were these were very common. We would hear them a lot uh, under the deck in the summertime calling, and then also uh, you, if you were turning over pieces of debris in the yard, like your your uh, the tray under your downspout from your gutters or something, you'd find them in there under there. Uh, they're really small. They're only about an inch long, and that would be a pretty big one actually. Most of them are smaller than that, and um, they are usually brown. You can see I put a few pictures on here. They're, they're, they're kind of variable, but usually some version of brown with lighter colored stripes or blotches down the back. It's pretty common to have those two stripes down the back on the sides, but then you can see that upper left-hand picture. It's not as apparent. And uh, they also have a usually a bar between the eyes. You can see there's that stripe that moves you know, on the top of the head from one eye to the other. That's pretty common. And then they also usually have um, a few bumps on their skin, um, maybe not quite, you know, to the extent of a toad or something like that, but they do have a few bumps. And uh, they have no webbing between their toes. You can see that in the pictures here. Um, actually our native toads, which spend almost all their time on land, have more webbing than they do. And it's because uh, Cuban flat-headed frogs or greenhouse frogs have virtually no need to go in the water. They're not really built to swim. They um, actually never have to go in the water. If they can help it, they will simply lay their eggs on land in a moist, secluded place under a log or under a piece of debris in your yard or your, your, one of your kid's toys or an old swim pool you left out, something that gives them a moist area uh, that's protected from the elements. They will lay their eggs there and the uh, larvae develop inside the egg. They um, go through the tadpole stage within the egg and so they never need any water and they just hatch out of the egg as, as little froglets, uh, tiny little froglets. And uh, if you, uh, or hearing strange noises in the summertime that sound like a bird, like a wren or something uh, flitting around under your porch at night um, and you live in, in sort of coastal Georgia or south Georgia, it's, it's, it's likely uh, one, of these, one of these frogs calling for a mate. They're, they're probably, again, not uh, really invasive. They don't seem to, for one, um, survive very far away from human habitation. And then also, uh, number two, they, they just, they're just very small, they eat tiny insects, and um, the combination of those things just makes them less prone to being invasive. Uh, now, if you go, to, especially if you go down into Florida, um, they, they are more expansive in their, you know, their, their range. They, they can live in the woods in Florida, basically, uh, but it's probably a little too cold in a good bit of Georgia, maybe not on the coast, uh, but most of Georgia is a little too cold for them to survive very far away from your house. All right, and then here's kind of the big bad as far as frogs go. This one got a lot of press recently, um, the Cuban tree frog. So unlike the uh, Cuban flat-headed frog, the tree frog from Cuba is very large. They're um, maybe not quite the size of my hand, but the size of some of y'all's hands, and they would certainly cover my entire palm. These uh, frogs get to be up to about six inches long. Um, which is much, much larger than even our largest native tree frog, the bark and tree frog, which would, you know, maybe barely cover my palm. Um, so if you see a tree frog the size of your hand, it's probably a Cuban tree frog. Um, <clears throat> they have, uh, their sightings have kind of increased recently. We've had a lot more people um, telling us they've seen them, uh, sending us pictures and things like that. Uh, we don't really know for sure if they're reproducing in Georgia, although given the number of sightings, it seems likely that they are, and these aren't just one-off introductions. So <clears throat> here's kind of a description of them. Like I said, they get very large, much larger than our, any of our native tree frogs. So if you see a frog the size of your hand sticking to the glass on your truck or your house, it is probably a Cuban tree frog. But everything starts out small and so as they grow they could potentially look like some of our native frogs and then to add some kind of uh, complexity to that they're really variable 
you know, if you ask me, what does a Cuban tree frog, like what color are they or what pattern they have? It's really variable. And you can see here, like the top picture, let's say that top picture is probably the most typical. They're usually kind of tan or brown color with very few markings or very faint markings. But like you can see that bottom picture, uh, they occasionally have some green on them, especially when they're young. Uh, and they can have a variety of kind of stripes and bars and things on the back. Uh, they also tend to have warts on their skin. Uh, our native tree frogs either have smooth skin or maybe uh, what you would describe as granular skin. So it wouldn't feel like sandpaper, but it might look like sandpaper. Um, these actually have isolated raised warts, um, kind of similar to a toad. In fact, you can probably see that really well on this one. This is a big, big warty one here. So they commonly have those. And um, then they have very large toe pads, even larger than our native tree frogs, uh, certainly larger than the tympanum, which is the eardrum on a frog. You can see um, the uh, tympanum when you can see it right here in this picture. Uh, then the toe pads are, are at least that big and often bigger. <clears throat> uh, another thing that comes up is um, juvenile Cuban tree frogs are often overlooked. They, you know, because they do start out small. Um, they're, you know, when they metamorphose, they might only be an inch long or so. And uh, they look different than the adults. You can see that in that lower left picture. They have uh, kind of greenish colored stripes on their face and sides. Um, you know, one through the eye and down the side, and then another kind of that runs down the, uh, the lips and onto the lower side. Uh, and they're, they're a combination of green and brown. And then uh, blue bones, people say that they have blue bones. You can uh, actually see through the skin on the small juvenile uh, Cuban tree frogs. If you were to hold one and hold its leg outstretched, um, you could, if you had good lighting, you could see the bones through the skin and uh, their, their bones appear blue. I don't, I don't know why that is, but um, their bones do appear blue. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, very variable, but they do have a few characteristics you can use uh, to help ID them. And so why are we more concerned about Cuban tree frogs than, than some of these other species? Uh, for one, they're voracious predators. They're, they're just a bigger frog and they're very aggressive and they will eat anything they can put in their mouth, pretty much. Um, even, even like small rodents and things uh, could, could get eaten. And so th there's a, a really famous, or famous, a very popular picture to share there. I, I was able to find, um, there's one that ate a Christmas light. I don't know if there was a bug sitting on the Christmas light moving around or what, but, but it ended up swallowing that whole light. Um, and then on the right, which is more of a concern, we're not too worried about them eating people's Christmas lights. Um, is uh, that is a Cuban tree frog eating, uh, was actually our state amphibian, a green tree frog. And uh, they are, uh, like the uh, brown knolls, there's some evidence that they actually uh, decrease populations of uh, native frogs in areas where they occur. And uh, they've expanded throughout Florida and uh, show up very regularly in Georgia at this point. Um, records scattered certainly all over South Georgia and the coastal region. And uh, they even turn up sometimes near, um, there's some records up near Chattanooga uh, and, and Atlanta and places like that. Uh, Tifton, there was one more, uh, well, Adel. There's one found on a car in Adel a few years ago. Uh, that, that animal probably hitched a ride uh, on that vehicle from Florida or some other area. Um, we had one turn up uh, very recently in an RV. Uh, some folks were staying in um, Stephen C. Foster State Park in Okefenokee, and um, they had recently been to the coast to uh, Crooked River State Park, stayed there in their RV, and then they didn't find the frog until they were at Stephen C. Foster. And so that's probably their main method of getting transported is on vehicles. And so they get into you know the new areas and are able to reproduce, uh, if it's, you know, at least if you get a couple of them. Um, 
and uh, they, they eat a lot of stuff, uh, like I said, native frogs, but also other things. And so we're, we're concerned about Cuban tree frogs. Uh, we, we encourage people to let us know if they see them, if possible, take a picture of them. Um, and we can help you identify that animal because sometimes it turns out to be some other frog. Uh, I'd say probably most of the time it turns out to be some other native frog, but, but every now and then it is a Cuban and we, we'd like to know where they occur. Um, and if you can, please don't release that animal because you may be releasing it in a new area. You might be assisting their, their spread throughout the state uh, by releasing frogs that you find, you know, in your yard or on your vehicles or in your house. Um, so yeah, let us, let us know if you see those and I'll have some contact information or a website you can report those to as well uh, near the end of the presentation. And then this is the really big one. This is the one that made the news um, a lot over the last couple of years, but the Argentine tegu or the black and white tegu. Um, the first that our section knew of them in Georgia was uh, 2018. Um, was, you know, there were some isolated animals reported prior to that, escaped pets and things like that. But as far as a potentially established naturalized population of tegus, uh, that was 2018 before we heard of that. Um, this is where they're native to. Um, South America, Central and, and kind of getting into Southern South America. And if you were to, just to give you an idea, um, down here at the Southern end of their range, you know, we think of South America as being a, a warm tropical place and a good bit of it is, but it's not all that way. Um, where they're found down here in uh, Argentina, uh, that is about 40 degrees latitude South. That is roughly the same as Pennsylvania in the US. So they can tolerate uh, certainly cooler conditions than where they're currently found in Georgia even. Uh, the, num the number of habitats they're found in is, is really variable. Um, you know, coastal habitats, rainforests, uh, highlands, so sort of hills and, and uh, you know, the bases of mountain ranges and things, uh, grasslands and savannas, uh, farmland, they, they can live just about anywhere that there's a hole in the ground and something to eat. This is what they look like. They're, they, uh, they're a big lizard, first of all. If you, if you see an adult tegu, you, it will be the largest lizard you have ever seen in the woods in your life. In fact, uh, I, would, I would think the most common thing you would mistake it for would be a small alligator. Um, like this says, you know, up to four and a half feet in length. Um, and uh, they have really large jowls. Uh, the, the musculature behind the, the jaws on the males is, is usually pretty big. And they have black and white bands across the, across the body. Um, and then there's this, you can see the nodules. These are, uh, these are uh, glands associated with the vent in males. They have, they're really large. Although if you are looking at those, it means you caught it <laughs> or, or killed it maybe. But, um, you know, I wouldn't expect most people to be able to lift a, lift a tegu skirt and tell you that they saw, saw glands on its vent. Um, the juveniles, though, are often, um, well, a lot of people don't realize how different they look. The juveniles actually have green on them. They're, they're kind of a green lizard, and they're not, they're still a big lizard. When they hatch, they're already larger than most of the lizards in Georgia that, that have legs. Uh, we have legless lizards, too, that are larger, but um, juvenile tegus hatch at about you know, nine inches, maybe 10 inches, sometimes larger than that. And so they're already uh, pretty big when they come out of the egg and they have green on them. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you might overlook those or, or you may not, um, but uh, we, we've started including some pictures of those in some of our outreach materials just to see. Uh, we still haven't found any juvenile or hatchling tegus in Georgia. They, they've all been, you know, small to middle-sized adults and a few big, you know, big adults. And by, by small, I mean a couple feet long. Uh, they're, they're a diurnal lizard, so you mainly see them in the daytime. Uh, they are mostly on the ground. They don't typically climb a whole lot. There's some other big lizards that climb a lot, like monitor lizards, but tegus will usually just run along on the ground and, and aren't 
either aren't very good at climbing trees or don't like to, uh, they will usually run away. If you were to see one it would and try to approach it, it would probably just flee from you, but um, beware, they will defend themselves. If you corner them, they, they, they have very powerful jaws, sharp teeth, and um, they can actually whip you with their tail pretty good too. The, their diet and feeding, that's one of the things that makes them, uh, another thing that, that makes them potentially invasive, you know, so they can live almost anywhere and it turns out they can eat almost anything. They are, they're active foragers, so they travel around uh, using that, that long tongue you see there uh, to smell or taste the landscape uh, to find food. And they're, they're really fond of eggs. They really like to eat, um, you know, ground nesting bird eggs, turtle eggs, uh, lizard and snake eggs. They'll also eat live animals, rodents, snakes, other lizards, and then they'll even eat like fruits and vegetables. Um, so they, they can eat just about anything. They uh, usually, uh, at least from what we know about them in Florida, and we're starting to learn more about them in Georgia, uh, and it seems to be fairly close to the same. Uh, maybe they don't emerge as early in Georgia. In Georgia, they typically don't emerge, it seems like, till about March. Uh, but in Florida, at least February through April, that's when animals start coming out of brumation, which is kind of like hibernation for reptiles. Um, they come out and then they mate in the spring. And then uh, summertime would be when the eggs are hatching. And then by October, all the animals go underground. They, they spend uh, the winters in burrows, which they either dig themselves or what they most often do is uh, kind of take over the burrow that some other animal made. They uh, reproduce at just a couple years of age. They don't have to live very long to, to be able to reproduce. Uh, they rep reproduce every year and they can lay a lot of eggs, uh, 30, 35 eggs or so. And then something that's kind of, I guess, neat about them is that they can actually uh, raise their body temperature above the amb ambient temperature uh, during the reproductive season. It's not something they do all year round, but while they're, they're reproductively active, uh, animals can raise their body temperature. And so all this kind of comes together to, to build an animal that has the potential to be a, a very big problem for Georgia. Uh, this is a, just a picture of their skull. They have a you know, like I said, strong jaws, sharp teeth. And as you can see, the teeth are variable in shape. They have sharp pointy teeth in the front for catching things. And then, uh, you know, flatter kind of blade-like teeth for chopping and grinding up things in the back. I'll kind of go through the rest fairly quickly because I think we're running low on time. But um, this is some uh, diet research from Florida. Uh, they've eaten, um, a lot of things in Florida uh, of note, you can see that they have eaten gopher tortoises. And uh, that's interesting because that's a species that we've done a lot of conservation work for here in Georgia, you know, across the Southeast. And, um, you know, we would hate to see that work undermined uh, by, by a species like this. And then uh, also swamp eels, which are an, another invasive species. They, they ate some of those. Uh, and these are some Georgia specimens and some things we found. A lot of amphibians and reptiles, a uh, few insects and some fruit uh, for the most part so far. And then this is another tegu uh, being dissected and you can see there uh, well-developed ova or eggs in the track. So that we, we, we're pretty certain at this point um, that tegus are reproducing in Georgia. That there's just been such a number of them caught now that that's almost certainly the case. And uh, you know, but by, by number, I mean um, nine that were actually trapped in 2019. And then I think we trapped six in 2020. Uh, and then there were several others uh, that were either dead on the road or collected by the public and then some other credible sightings. So, I mean, they, they pop up regularly um, in South Georgia. So here's... Um, Here's where they, we think they came from. They're very popular in the pet trade and they get really big and basically people decide they can't care for this really large lizard anymore and they probably turn some loose in that, in that area. And that, that's the area we're talking about, Tombs and Tattnall County. That's where uh, the vast majority of Tegu sightings have come from. Uh, like I said, we've had sightings all over the state pretty much, but it's usually an isolated event where there's one animal that was probably either released 
or escaped captivity and then and then was recovered later. Uh, but but in this area within that square there, down kind of in the onion belt of Georgia, uh, there does seem to be an established population. And so we put out a lot of outreach materials, social media um, and email blasts to try and get people to report sightings. Uh, we have some fact sheets and things here. We have a, a actually a web page, uh, georgewildlife.com forward slash tegus. There's an entire information page and information for how to report them and identify them and, and things like that there. Um, and this is one of the uh, flyers that, that we, or I'm sorry, mailers that we made. We actually mailed out to people in the community um, and, and did get a good bit of feedback on it. We, uh, this is where uh, one of the places we asked people to report tangues, uh, georgiainvasives.org. Uh, you can go in there and submit your sighting. And um, if you can try to get a picture of it, um, that may or may not always be possible. But uh, it helps us verify that it is a tegu and not some other native lizard. Or uh, I actually had an armadillo reported one time as a tegu. Uh, but you know, please try to get a picture if you can. Uh, if not, still still submit your sighting and uh, describe it to the best you know best of your ability, and we'll see if we can sort it out. Uh, here's some pictures of tegus collected, you know, uh, trapped or or collected by other means in Georgia. So you can get an idea of the size of them. They're, they're, they're a really big lizard. That one on the left-hand picture there, that's, you know, a small one and it's still a couple feet long. And then here's kind of a map of the area with some dates when we found them. You see most of the sightings are 2018, 2019. That was, um, you know, sort of us looking for them, but um, there's some, there's some, some records that go back farther than that. Uh, you know, 2011, one, one record from the area. Here's a tegu track. We have a, a manual or not a manual, but a, a, a outreach flyer that talks about identifying tracks. They typically have a straight um, kind of tail drag in the middle. It might meander some from side to side and you might even see imprints of the scales in the legs. And so we, we have uh, partnered with um, Georgia, uh, Georgia Southern University and U.S. Geologic Survey, they've helped us out a lot with trapping efforts. Uh, these are some earlier pictures, you know, 2018, 2019 trapping. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, from DNR and these organizations, as well as Orient Society have helped us at various times, as well as the general public with uh, looking for and trapping for these things. And uh, looking ahead into 2021, uh, we're going to start trapping fairly soon. And uh, we're going to kind of change up what we're doing a little bit and do a lot more um, camera traps. We're going to run a, a, you know, probably about 80 or so camera traps in the area to see if we can sort out what the uh, extent of the infestation is and, and find new areas that have tegus and not just, you know, keep trapping the same, same places, uh, just try and figure out where they're at now. So, um, so that's kind of wrapping it up. You know, like I said, I work for wildlife conservation section, which is used to be called the non-game section. Um, if you'd like to help us out with, you know, this or other efforts, uh, one of the big things you can do is uh, get one of those license plates, you know, one of the patriotic eagles, or uh, uh, I think we have one that's not on here is the monarch butterfly. Now, um, we don't get, uh, we get very little state funding. So we appreciate all the help uh, that, that you could give us. Um, if you want to know more, here's links to our uh, Twitter accounts and things like that. But um, with that, I'll uh, take any questions people have. Oh, I see. Yeah, what bait should be used to trap them? Eggs. We use chicken eggs. It works really well. Do they kill them? Uh, yes, we dispatch all the animals um, and, uh, you know, they're put down humanely uh, using uh, chemical process, same thing you do with your, your pets, basically. And uh, then their uh, necropsy is done to look at gut contents and then also uh, reproductive condition and, and parasites. That's one thing I didn't mention is we're kind of worried about parasites that might spill over uh, from them to our native animals. 
the two goes on. Um, they can be found in dry areas or wet areas. They, they really don't mind, mind either. Um, uh, Lance McBrayer at Georgia Southern University actually just happens to have done a lot of research on tegus before this. And he said pretty much anywhere that there could be a hole in the ground, they're, they're perfectly at home. Any exotic salamanders? Uh, you know, salamanders, not so much. They just, uh, they aren't, they're, they're just, maybe they're more fragile, um, but they don't, they don't tend to get around um, as well as, as frogs and, uh, and lizards and, and things. I'm not sure why. Do I think more legislation on exotic pet ownership would help? Uh, possibly. Um, you know, Florida is um, working on some new re uh, legislation now, regulations to uh, basically require a special permit to possess tegus in Florida. Um, there's some particulars of that, I think that are still getting worked out, but um, we're, and we're discussing a, a response now in Georgia because what we don't want to have happen is all those breeders and distributors to now look, for, look to Georgia to offload those tegus instead. Um, and so we're, we're discussing some kind of, um, some kind of response to that now, but uh, we're, we're not, we're not, um, too far down the road yet. We're, we're still just talking about it. red eared sliders. Uh, yeah, red eared sliders are not native to most of Georgia. Um, they're more so native to kind of the South central U S and they get the same thing. They get dumped out you know, you, people get a, a pet turtle and they don't realize that it's going to grow to the size of a, I don't know, a Chinette platter. And um, yeah, they, they dump them out. So we yeah, certainly don't do that. It is actually illegal to release non-native reptiles or, or non-native wildlife of any kind in Georgia. Should you kill brown and owls? Um, it, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt anything to do so. I'm not sure it would help a whole lot. Uh, just if you already have a population established in, like somewhere, um, but you know, I certainly wouldn't release any anywhere. Um, you know, it's kind of like, do you make us? I, I guess I don't understand. Are you make saying should you make a special effort to, or should you like get rid of the one that you already have in your hand? Um, yeah, I certainly wouldn't advise releasing them, certainly not in a place where they're not already established. Oh, that's a good question. How do we humanely euthanize Cuban tree frogs? Uh, some people just put them in a freezer, in a Tupperware. Um, that's, um, that probably works okay, but even better is to take uh, Aura Gel, the same stuff, like if you, you have a toothache or something, um, the uh, the chemicals in that aura gel that numb numb your gums actually if you smear a bunch of it on a frog's back it will euthanize it it'll basically put it to sleep you do that and then just to be safe you can throw it in the freezer just to make sure uh, but that makes sure that there's no no pain or, or anything like that uh, for the frog I know there are several reptile sanctuaries that take in pets to prevent people from dumping pets. Does DNR, DNR work with any of these? Um, we, I mean, we don't necessarily, I, so yeah, sometimes. Um, there's, there's one agency, or not agency, um, one organization, uh, the Georgia Reptile Society. They're, they're um, really good at rehoming animals and such. If you, if you have an unwanted pet or you know someone that has an unwanted pet, you can contact uh, Georgia Reptile Society and sometimes they will uh, kind of offer like a rehoming service for them. Um, there are some things that they don't take just because they're already overloaded with animals right now and they're hard to get rid of. But, um, you know, they're a good one. Also, uh, Southeastern Reptile Rescue, Jason Clark, he's out of Middle, middle Georgia near Griffin. Um, they sometimes uh, help people rehome unwanted reptiles or amphibians. How long after coating do you put in the freezer? Basically until the frog's motionless and limp. You know, it might take a few minutes, several minutes.
Yeah, and somebody else just said, yeah, about five minutes for uh, or gel. Yeah. Well, do we have any other questions? Don't want to keep you all here all day. All right, well, Daniel, thank you so much for your time. Um, I think everyone enjoyed this talk. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Um, I appreciate y'all for listening in. I wish we could have seen each other's faces the whole time. All right. Maybe next time. We'll have to have you back again. All right. All right. See y'all. Have a good day. No problem. Bye.